Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Fertility Confidence Podcast. Today, we're talking under eating, and I wanted to bring this topic to the podcast for a couple of reasons. One, we have had this conversation quite a few times in Fertility Confidence Method lately. So what I find is I I notice, and I notice this in my private practice too, and I think you can talk to like any practitioner and they can probably make this claim because I know I hear my friends saying the same thing where we see things in like clusters and clumps that there seems to always be like a bit of a theme, whether it's for the day or for the week or for the month. And we've had a few different themes of um, like various questions, complaints, diagnoses that have come in with our community members over the last couple of weeks. But this is one that we keep having this conversation and, and, and reminding our clients how important it is to actually look at this as a potential treatment philosophy. So first and foremost, why does this matter? Why are we actually talking about under eating? I find when we're discussing health and, and fertility, especially it, it so often talks about about weight loss and maintaining a healthy BMI and not overeating or overindulging, but we don't actually look at the other side of that coin. And as somebody who has struggled with low appetite quite literally my entire life, I fall into this trap very easily, very, very easily. So I know firsthand, first and foremost, how easy it is to under eat without actually doing it on purpose <laughs> for lack of a better word and for for just falling into this by trying to make healthy choices right we see it all the time and and I do it all the time and then not really knowing or understanding how much you're eating how much calories and macro breakdown is in specific foods it's just part of a learning curve. And so how we actually, first and foremost, I just want to make this claim that we don't teach a lot of like macro counting, weighing your food, that type of style of eating with our clients in FCM. Truthfully, if you're dealing with infertility, like you have enough on your plate. We don't need to make eating more complicated. So we teach a more uh, visual system and that might work well for some and might not for others. So we personalize that for our clients along the way. But I don't need you going, I don't need you listening to this episode and then going out and like drastically changing everything that you do. I just want you to pay attention. Okay, so why does this matter? When we undereat, we are impacting our cortisol. Cortisol is our stress hormone. And our stress hormone is released in a wide variety of places. And it's not always bad. We need cortisol. We need a little bit of cortisol. We need it to spike in the morning to help us get out of bed. And then we need it to slowly come down through the day so that we can make melatonin and go to sleep. And we're gonna have this like wave pattern, basically. We want that there. So we don't want nothing. And when we have nothing, we're having a different conversation. We're talking about burnout, right? And when we're talking about cortisol, when we're talking about stress, and I ask women, what are your what are your main stressors right now? Infertility, finances, work, relationships. Those are typically the big four. And we think about things that we can relate to in our like world essentially, right? We all relate to work stress. We've all likely had work stress. If you're listening to this podcast, I assume you can relate possibly to infertility stress, even if you're new into your journey, right? Because you're like, well, why isn't it working yet? If you're longer in your journey, we have like a whole other kind of can of worms when it comes to stress. But we don't often think about physical stress. And this is something that we teach our clients because we so often think, oh, if I just meditate and journal and delegate out some tasks or, or, you know, say no to a few things and set some boundaries that, that that's good enough. And for some women that will be, but if we're only looking and observing our psychological stressors, that's the word I was looking for earlier. Thank you, brain. 
psychological stressors, but we are ignoring our physical or environmental stressors. That's how we kind of lump them together with our clients. We are only waging half the battle. And as someone who deals with burnout, it's it's important that we come at this from both angles. So there's a there's a wide variety of, of different physical stresses. And we've actually talked about this in the podcast before when I shared about my burnout. If you go back, there's part one, part two, part three, stress and infertility. So we talk about other psychological and physical stressors in those three episodes. Highly recommend going back and listening to them if you're new to the podcast. And if you are new, welcome. Thanks for hanging out with me. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode, okay? So when we undereat, our cortisol is re- is amplified. Why? Our body's stressed. It's under stress because it's not sure if it's going to get enough juice to make the energy that it needs. That's like the best way to describe it. It's it is going to do its absolute best with what it has, but It's also going to like live in fear of like, well, what's the next day going to be like? (laughs) Is she going to feed me more or should I like stock up for the future, AKA store things as fat topic for another day? Okay. We're not going to go down that path, but when our cortisol is high, so we're under eating, we're doing this chronically, meaning it's not just like a one bad day, but this is like a fairly consistent habit Whether you're aware of it or not, that doesn't matter. A consistent habit with you, it's releasing cortisol. When our cortisol is chronically elevated, it impacts the way our pituitary messages to our ovaries. So we are immediately seeing a down regulation in GnRH. That is the hormone that's telling your pituitary, yo, we need LH and FSH. So what happens when those hormones are decreased? Well, if FSH is decreased, we're likely not maturing a follicle as well as we could or at all. We're likely not getting that dominant follicle response that we want. If LH isn't able to surge, we aren't ovulating. So we have this pattern. Whenever we have long, irregular cycles, we always have to take it back to stress. You know, there's a long laundry list of things we need to look at, but this has to be in our diagnostic profile. It just has to be. It also can reduce the way, the amount of estradiol that your body produces, estrogen. So if our estrogen is lower, what's happening then? Our lining isn't thickening. Our follicles likely aren't maturing the way that they should. We're now leading into potential ovulatory issues. No bueno, right? The other pieces of this, so the hormone piece is fairly basic, but then we have this whole other concept of inflammation and immune modulation. When your cortisol is dysregulated, it's impacting the inflammatory profile in your body. It's impacting your body's immune system. And if you've been around here long enough, you'll know we care about those things, especially for women who've been told They have unexplained infertility, that everything looks good. They're trying the things and it's not working. They've had recurrent miscarriages. They've had um, medicated cycles that haven't been working. If this is an area we haven't explored, we need to. And when we're talking about inflammation and and, and immunological, I've been trying to avoid saying that word because I knew I was going to trip on it. (sighs) Immunological response we can't leave cortisol out of that discussion either. Sometimes finding the actual root cause is tricky. I just want to acknowledge that because so many of these pieces and hormones and the way in which your body works to be fertile, everything overlaps in such a way that we can't often actually dig, 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 dig down and be like, this is it. Because sometimes we dig, we treat, and we uncover another layer. We treat, we uncover another layer. And for some women, there's not a lot of layers. And for others, there is. And this is why having someone that's willing to really like go the distance with you and be proactive and and be progressive in treatment and testing is important if this is part of your story. I am so excited to open the doors for our Fertility Confidence Bootcamp for the first time in 2024. We are going live February 12th, we are live together for five days 
And the best part about Fertility Confidence Bootcamp is it's not just another webinar that you're gonna sign up for, maybe half-ass listen to, and then let it just simmer in your inbox for the rest of time. Yes, you have to come and listen to the information, but I promise you, you are gonna walk away with tangible action steps to implement moving forward. In fact, if you actually do the implementation with me through the bootcamp week, we are gonna be giving away over $4,000 worth of prizes just for doing the work. So you aren't just gonna get the information, we are building out an action plan for you, for your fertility journey together with all of the support that we offer to our Fertility Confidence Method members. It is such a fun week. We absolutely love, love, love running bootcamp, and I hope that you can join me. All you need to do is head over to ttc.kelseyduncan.com slash bootcamp. So physical stressors and psychological stressors, they're not different internally. So under eating, not fueling your body properly is no different than you working an 80 hour work week. It's no different. Your body doesn't see it different. Under eating and under fueling your body is no different than you running away from a bear. The hormonal response internally is exactly the same. So if you're sitting there going, well, Kelsey, I meditate 10 minutes a day Therefore, I am no longer stressed. But then in the back of your mind, you're going, wow, I'm still wicked anxious. I am definitely still stressed. This is not helping me at all. I'm not saying your five minute, 10 minute, whatever meditation is not doing you any good. It is doing you an amazing abundance of good because it's helping you sit into that parasympathetic nervous system. In fact, I'll challenge you, if you're someone who's implemented meditation into your self-care routine, I'll challenge you to lengthen out that time because from personal experience, I can tell you as a woman, that is very, very driven, ambitious, and a little crazy <laughs> when it comes to work and what she thinks she has the capacity for. As someone who definitely lives a stressful existence, it takes me significantly longer than like five to seven minutes, even I would argue 10 minutes, to actually like get into the meditation. <laughs> After five minutes, I'm still like, no, no good, okay? So if you're like, this isn't working for me, I still have a monkey brain, I'm not calm. Just honestly, it feels painful at first, but longer is better, longer is better. And we know that the parasympathetic nervous system really truly doesn't come into play until like 15 minutes. So if we're not going that far, like we're not likely getting a huge amount of benefit from that either. I'm not saying your five minutes is bad because truthfully, one minute of breathing and stopping and not go, go, going is beneficial. And all the pockets of one minutes that you have, they add up over time. So I'm not telling you to stop. I can hear, I can hear people saying, oh, this isn't worth it, but that's not what I'm saying at all. Now, before we wrap up here, I want to like, I want to give you kind of like a little bit of a tip and trick on like, what does this mean? Like I've said under eating, but like, what does that actually mean? And the reality is, is women are notorious under eaters for a wide variety of reasons that we're not going to unbox together right now. But what I think is most useful for you, if you're like, I don't really know, or if you're like, Hmm, I definitely know this is me but how bad is it? And this is something that I do myself probably a couple times a year, honestly, when I'm like, oh, Kelsey, you've not been doing a great job. So I let the numbers prove it to myself. And I let the numbers kind of scare me back into like really, really focusing on this. And I do that by tracking. So we don't have our clients track consistently. And I think there's positive and ne positives and negatives, and it may serve you and it may not, and that's okay. But if we can get you to track for two or three days and just see, like, I want you to do average days. I don't want you to change anything. I don't want you to 
um, be like, okay, I'm going to do like my absolute best today and I'm going to track. No, because then we're not actually seeing your normal. You know what I mean? In private practice, when I used to do this a lot with clients, when I was working, you know, outside of the fertility scope and, and treating like gut health and things like that, I was like, okay, I want you to do a diet diary for me for seven days, but I want to see the good, the bad, the ugly. Like you can't hide stuff from me or I can't help you. Like if I don't know what you're actually doing, I can't help you. So you have to think about it that way for yourself as well. If we try to make our food journal look better than it would on an average day, you actually aren't helping yourself at all. So what's the point? Okay, so the good, the bad, the ugly. I want you to just keep things the same. I don't want you to make any changes. And we really, I personally really like using my fitness pal. Um, I would, I don't love that you have to put in like your weight goals and things like that. That's, you know, we're not here for that piece of things. And I don't know if you can turn that off or not. Um, and another one is chronometer. Chronometer has a little bit more detail in terms of uh, nutrients and, and vitamins and minerals, which is kind of cool. I don't have as much hands-on experience with that one, but I know that it works really, really well. And you can put in recipes and also there's a huge database. So for example, I actually did this for myself a couple of weeks ago coming out of Christmas to, again, prove to myself that I need to do better. And we eat a lot of half-baked harvest recipes. So I was actually searching half-baked harvest and what we had and 80% of the time it was actually coming up, which was so great. That means somebody else took the time to put the recipe in the database for me, bless them because it saved me. Like I wouldn't have tracked otherwise. So I find it very tedious and annoying. You might as well. Uh, and that's okay. We don't have to do it forever, but it can be really helpful to see the numbers. So put the numbers in, look at total calories, look at your protein, look at your fat, glance at your carbs, look at your sugar, okay? What I find is oftentimes women are actually eating about 1,100 to 1,300 calories a day and thinking that that's healthy. And it's not. It's not enough. It's likely very close to your bare bones of survival. And when we're trying to get pregnant, bare bones survival mode is not the vibe, okay? We want optimal. We want your mitochondria to have all of the tools at its disposal to make energy. It is, they are the life house of our entire system and your ovaries are the richest organ in your body of mitochondria. If your mitochondria are suffering to make energy because it doesn't have the building blocks that it needs and your body doesn't have the building blocks that it needs, this is just no longer going to be a priority. We need to fuel our body appropriately. Everybody's sort of like base calorie count is different. So I am not going to spew numbers to you right now. I gave you a little bit of like, if you're in this range, we want to go higher. Ideally, we want to see things between 1,700 to 2,500 a day, depending on your body, your fitness, right? How you move your body and the way in which you move your body are actually going to change these numbers. If you are someone who's trying to put on muscle, if you're strength training, if you're working out every day, even if you're doing yoga and Pilates every day and not lifting weights, that's fine. Your body needs more calories, more protein to support that movement. So not every day maybe even has to be the same. We might have a little fluctuation there and that's okay too. This is a very personal experience and it's where having the experts come in and put a plan in place for you can make a really big difference because I understand that all of this can sound incredibly overwhelming. And so when I do this habit for myself, when I'm like, okay, Kelsey, you're not feeling very great. I know, I already know I'm under eating. I, I just, I'm aware, but I track anyways to show myself where are we and where do we need to go from here? And oftentimes for me, it's implementing a snack once or twice a day. And that jacks me up into a good range for myself. And it often is an eye opener around protein intake and that I need to be 
aware and plan protein. And if I don't, I'm probably not getting enough, especially for my exercise routine. So tracking can be incredibly, incredibly powerful that way. Hopefully this was helpful for you. I have so much more I feel like to say on this topic, but we're gonna just get so out of the realm of fertility. So we're gonna keep it short and sweet today. And I will see you guys in the next episode.